fifth out of 66 books in the Bible. Jude, half-brother of Jesus, beginning at verse number three. Very impactful. You've heard it said before, most of you, if not all of you, that Jude could be called the Acts of the Apostates, while, of course, Luke wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost the book of Acts, which we call it Acts of the Apostles, also known as the Acts of the Holy Spirit, Acts of the Holy Ghost. And so the book of Jude, verse number 3, it gives a warning that is probably as pertinent or more pertinent uh, now than it has ever been. The Bible informs us that evil men and seducers would wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So Jude kind of gives us this clarion call as a watchman on the wall to look out for this. Jude, verse number three. He says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. The angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath preserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And I just want to talk to us for a little while on the subject of the common faith. The common faith. Why don't we just pray? Ask God to open our hearts once again to receive the word of God. Let everybody talk to the Lord. God, I glorify you. I love you, Lord Jesus Christ. I need you to anoint these lips of clay, God. And Jesus, God, help all of our hearts to be open to receive the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. We want to prepare our heart to receive of your word, God. God, don't let us be forgetful hearers, but doers of the word. And God, will give you all the glory and the honor and the adoration, God. Your word is quick, Jesus. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And it's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart, Lord. And God, just do your work in us tonight. And God, will give you all the glory and adoration. Your word is creative. It created everything. God, it will do awesome things tonight. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. And why don't we all say amen? amen? Amen. The common faith. This is what separates us from other peoples in the world, other religions in the world. God's people has always been a called out people. Whether it was Abraham being called out of Ur of the Chaldees into the promised land, whether it was the Israelites being a peculiar or particular people unto God, whether it was God creating a seemingly enclosed garden for Adam and Eve, that God's people have always been a called out people, and we are no exception. Some would actually say the Greek word ekklesia for church means the called out ones, the pulled out ones. We're different. We have the Spirit of God. We have the name of the Lord Jesus. We're followers of Jehovah God, the one true and living God in Jesus Christ. And uh, so we come to the book of Jude, and we're looking at the common faith. I would like to mention that humans are fearfully and wonderfully made. Your brain, my brain, has more electronic connections than all of the electronic connections done by human hands in the entire world. Everybody's brain has about 100 trillion electronic connections. It is more than every electronic connection done by man in the entire world. Our three-pound liver does so much as far as purifying the blood and other things. But these objects, such as our brain and such as our liver, are of no good unless there is a body with form in it, a body with bones in it. This is what doctrine is to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God does many things. 
But doctrine, the word of God, and the correct, rightly dividing the word of truth gives a body to that doctrine. So just as a human liver without a body, just without a skeletal system, is of no use, or a brain without a skeletal system is of no use, so it is that so many things in the spirit realm, unless you have correct doctrine, it's not going to benefit us in the long run. Doctrine is that which gives form to faith. Doctrine is merely the body of teaching. It is the body of doctrines that the church universally believes, as it's called here in the scripture, the common faith. God moves on all. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. John chapter 1, he says, I'm the true light. This is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He also says, that uh, he poured out his spirit upon all flesh. It says that they might happily feel after him. So all people can feel the presence of God. But it is only doctrine correctly applicated that brings it into a saving faith. Just because you feel the spirit of God does not indicate you're saved. Everyone can feel the spirit of God. But you and I have to have a correct doctrine in order for it to be salvic in our lives. So God desires us to learn about him, his people. We are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We're taken into captivity because of a lack of knowledge. And so it is up to us to learn the things of God. The Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth and the study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the, uh, the word of God, the spirit of truth, the word of truth. So the Bible is what gives us power, it gives us anointing, it gives us truth. The, the church is called the pillar and ground of the truth. And it's not based on opinion. Our opinions, in a certain sense, really don't matter. Amen. Because if we have a wrong opinion, if it doesn't line up with scripture, then we're going to end up you know, apart from Jesus Christ, we're going to end up in the lake of fire. So I don't want my opinion. The Bible says, Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. So I don't want my opinion. I want God's opinion. Amen. Hallelujah. And you've heard me say this before. People will come up to me on something that's pretty serious out of Scripture. They'll say, well, what do you think about this, Pastor Walter? And I'm like, well, what I think about it is totally irrelevant. Amen. What does the Bible think about it? What does God think about it? That's the thing that counts. So I want what thus saith the word of God. What does God say about things? Acts chapter 2, verse 42, right after, still on the day of Pentecost, right after the infilling of the Holy Ghost, awesome things happen. Acts 2, 42, and it says, here's what happened. 3,000 get baptized. And it says in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly. Everybody say steadfastly. I mean, it means they grabbed hold of it and would not let go. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, why is it important to have the apostles' doctrine? Why didn't it say Jesus' doctrine? Well, Jesus passed the baton to the apostles. That's what happened. And uh, in Luke chapter 24, verse 45, it says, He opened their understanding that they could understand the word of God. In John chapter 17, verse number 20, Jesus said this. This is considered his high priestly prayer, as it's sometimes called. It says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The apostles' word. So on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles got up and the apostle Peter got up, they didn't miss it. You know, he had passed the baton of doctrine to them, and they had the seal of Jesus Christ upon them to present this apostolic doctrine. Let's go to Luke chapter 24 and look at that real quick. Luke chapter 24. How would you like to have a Bible study from Jesus Christ? It would be kind of neat. You know, when they didn't know who he was on the road to Emmaus, and finally it was revealed to him in the breaking of bread. He says, we wondered why our hearts burned within us. Our hearts were burned. 
I don't know about you, but I've had Bible study before where my heart burned within me. Luke 24, 45, it says, Then, talking about Jesus, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. We'll go to verse 24 to kind of let us see it. Uh, maybe even a little plainer. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. And that's one reason we would say the Apocrypha is not inspired, holy writ. It may have some good history and things in it. But Jesus seemed to say you've got the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, which is how the Jews divided up what we would call the 39 books. They called the 22 books of the Old Testament. They combined a couple, you know, some books there. So what was written about Jesus in the entire Old Testament, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. So that was just a few days before the day of Pentecost. And uh, Jesus had prayed for them that people would believe on Jesus through the words of the apostles. And that's the reason it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now, here in the end time hour that we're living in, we go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, again, many of you have heard me say this before. This is the last book Paul probably ever wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And this is the last chapter of the last book. And so he's finishing his course. He's run his race. He's already been delivered out of the mouth of a lion before. Been through so much, like 2 Corinthians chapters 11 and 12 tell us. And this is what it says in verse number 2, 2 Timothy 4 and 2. He says, Timothy, real important, preach the word. And that's the reason we need a lot of people preaching. I value teaching. And I'll tell you, the difference of preaching and teaching is not just, preaching is not just teaching while you're screeching. That's a lot of people, they think, well, you do the same thing and you just raise your voice and it goes from teaching to preaching. But uh, teaching is giving and imparting uh, God's information, God's truths to people, and uh, doing it in a way that hopefully they can understand it as well. There is a law of the learner that says if the learner is not learned, the teacher is not taught. Now that's not always true, because people have to be willing to hear. There are sometimes people's ears, the Bible says, are heavy, and uh, they do not hear. But preach the word. And man, if this generation needs anything, it needs... I, you know, I believe in sharing personal experiences. I believe in using some illustrations. But we need people that will just preach the Word. and Because uh, you'll be safe when you preach the Word. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. But so many gifts of the Holy Ghost are manifested during the preaching of the Word of God. And uh, so you can't be gifts-driven. You've got to be the giver-driven. You know, Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. That means, Timothy, be ready always to give a reason for the faith that lies within you, so to speak. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. So reprove is say, well, I've had one action. Now I've got to say, here's what the Scripture says my action should be. That's reproving something. Rebuking something is to say that's just a totally wrong action. We need to not do that. Exhorting is what we might call motivating or encouraging. And then he says to do this with all long suffering and doctrine. If they don't get it after two years, keep preaching. Keep doing it. All long, all long suffering. It says much. It says, it says all. And but also do it with doctrine. We're talking about the common faith tonight. So tell them what the doctrines are. The Word of God is not just a free-for-all, so to speak. There is doctrine involved in it. There was a big thing back in the 90s, and uh, the saying was, doctrine doesn't matter. And, uh, friend, I need to tell you, I had a friend of mine that kind of wrote a counterbalance to that, and he's won many thousands of people to the Lord from that book. And the book's name is Doctrine Does Matter. Now, obviously, you've got to have love with doctrine. You have to have a right spirit with doctrine. You can't do, you just want to beat people over the head with doctrine, obviously. But uh, when you've got the winning combination of doctrine and the love and power of God, and doctrine will carry its own blessing with it. Correct doctrine is blessed. But it says, 
So do that all long suffering in doctrine. Now he, he begins to tell us what's going to happen in the end time. You go back to chapter 3, it's about the end time. 2 Timothy 4 3. For the time will come when they, he's talking about church people, will not endure sound doctrine. Sound, complete doctrine. Good doctrine. They're not going to endure it. What are they going to do? But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I always say, I want people to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And so we have to do that in today's, you know, they might even be passing laws that you can't preach what people need to hear. And so you can go anywhere and hear what you want to hear. Basically, the goal of the human heart and the human spirit is this. We want the blessings of God without the responsibilities of living for God. We want, okay, tell me where I can go, where I can get the blessings of God, relationship, and I can still do whatever I want to do. That is the human heart. That's just what humans, we've always wanted it. Started with Cain. God hears you sacrifice. It may not be a good one like my brothers, but I still got a relationship with you. And, and you go to the religion of Cain, the religion of Saul, the religion of Balaam. We always want the blessings of God, but we don't necessarily want the requirements of God. So it says in the end time, they'll heap to themselves teachers after their own lust, having itching ears, and shall turn away their ears from the truth. People won't even hear the truth of the word of God. And shall be turned unto fables. A fable is that which is not true. And so it, it may sound good, but it's just not true. And uh, that's the reason we need to pray. God, give us a love for truth. God, let me love truth. And I don't want to just have truth. Why? Well, I, I love truth when it's about going this way. I want truth coming this way too. I want to love it. You know, I just want to love truth regardless. Amen. But watch thou in all things endure. Let's everybody say endure. Oh, and dear afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 23, we're talking about the common faith tonight. It says, but foolish and unlearned questions of void, knowing that they do gender strife. What are the foolish and unlearned questions? It's again, it's the human heart trying to say, well, I want in a legal sense to try to justify myself to do something that I know the Word of God tells me to do, but uh, I'll just come up with some crazy doctrine so I don't have to do that, you know. So foolish and unlearned questions. Obviously, we're always open to uh, honest-hearted questions, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, not a lord over God's heritage, apt to teach, to impart, to share information. Patient. In meekness, don't get frustrated when somebody doesn't get something. Just keep sharing, keep loving, keep praying. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So this wonderful common faith uh, summed up in one word, doctrine. The term doctrine in Greek is didaskalia or didache, and it just means body or form. So let's go back to Jude verse 3 and look at what the scripture has to say about the common salvation. Hallelujah. I'm glad that means there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's not ten. There's not a hundred ways to get to heaven. There's one road. There's one pathway. Amen. Amen. Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Titus 1 4 calls it the common faith. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. We'll just read that. I already quoted some of it, but we'll read the whole thing. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Sorry, I didn't have this typed up. I didn't get in in time to do that. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. If you back up a little bit, there is one body. Not 50, not 100, there's one. And one spirit. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling. Some people don't get the 
the bride. And some people don't get the new heavens. And some people get the new earth. And there's one hope of our calling. And uh, so everyone who's coming through the gospel, regardless of, of label or independent, we're all part of one body. And uh, so that is a wonderful thing. And uh, so there is a common salvation. There is that faith that was once delivered unto the saints. The Bible says in this passage, it says we are to earnestly contend in the book of Jude. That means don't let it slip. Don't agree with those that would try to tell you doctrine does not matter. That every viewpoint is equally valid. We're living in a time, in a day, that... Uh, I remember I was looking up one of the presidential candidates and the New Yorker had an interview and it said this particular presidential candidate, the absolutist, and they were making fun of him because they said he actually believes that there's absolute truths. There's absolute truth. Well, I'm going to tell you there is. We're going to... Relativism is not a good philosophical doctrine. If everything is relative, then uh, even that statement is relative. Then that means things aren't relative. And uh, so relative, relativity, uh, you could argue its merits in a scientific context, but in a, as far as a doctrinal context, man, that is not good scripture. That is not good hermeneutics. But here in this end time hour, it seems like there's a push to blend and make everybody kind of the same. I remember back in the 60s, Simon Fletcher wrote a book, and it was called uh, something to the effect of I'm okay and you're okay. The name of the book was Situational Ethics, as a matter of fact. And one of the phrases in that book was, I'm okay and you're okay. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. If somebody's not born again of water and spirit, if somebody's not saved, they are not okay. They need to be born again of water and spirit. The worst thing, the worst form of hatred anybody could ever have is to tell somebody they're okay when they're not okay. I mean, that is horrible. That's the worst thing you can do to somebody. If somebody's like, well, I think I'm okay just doing this. Uh, you know, I, I talked with somebody last week, and, and they were just telling me. They were just, uh, well, I can't get over this, and I know the Bible's wrong here, and the Bible's wrong there, and the Bible's wrong there. Well, I can't just say, well, you're okay, man. He's not okay. You know, we can speak the truth in love. So, and none of us, that's that fine balance about having the fruit of the spirit of, fa of uh, gentleness, but then also contending earnestly for the faith that's once delivered unto the saints. None of us want to just strive for no reason. We like peace. God is a God of peace. But at the same time, you, if you just sit there and say, well, let's follow peace and never contend for the truth of the word of God, then truth will be lost. Truth not proclaimed is truth lost. And so this thing that everybody that just says, well, there's even a thing out there that says, if you say Jesus is Lord, well, first of all, they're misreading the scripture because really it says anybody that confesses with their mouth that Jesus is the Lord, because as it's been pointed out in book after book, that Hindus can say Jesus is Lord and uh, other groups can say Jesus is Lord. They have nothing to do. They don't even know the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ in these type of things. So it's not just saying Jesus is Lord. You've got to know him as the Lord. You've got to know him as the, the God, the one true and living God. In here, the, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily. And we are complete in him. So we have to earnestly, that means sincerely, uh, contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And I'm going to tell you, we're still in the same dispensation they were in in the New Testament. In the epistles, after the day of Pentecost, that was the birthday of the church. So we have to contend earnestly for the faith. Notice that modifier, the faith, not for faiths plural, not for a faith. And uh, it's got nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Jesus. This was Jesus, his plan that he had in his mind from eternity past. 
And so we have to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. When was it once delivered? I would say it was in the teachings of Jesus Christ. I would say it was in the great commission scriptures that he gave. I would say it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And then also during the epistles. The epistles teach us how to live. And so this is the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. So we don't need any more isms. We don't need any more denominations. We don't need more people following this reformer or that reformer or this schismatic or that schismatic or this person that gets some revelation about golden plates or this one that gets some revelation about the Great Pyramid. We need to go back to the Bible and understand that the Bible is the highest form of the church that we can have. And so we need to go back and say, what thus saith the word of God? And if the Bible says it, we just need to believe it and let that settle it. So we contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. We're not mean-spirited about it, but we are firm about it and say, look, this is what the Scripture says, and we pray for people to understand it, that God would open their minds. But then verse 4 is fascinating. It kind of goes back to 2 Timothy 4, because he says, For there are certain men crept in unawares. Now, I remember I was at a conference, a youth congress, probably back in 1988. It was at the Civic Center in Atlanta. There was between six and 7,000 people there at that particular youth congress. And Bishop Wagner gets up to preach. And he says, now, I, I looked this up in the Greek language. And he says that term crept means they look at you in the eye, but they're moving perpendicular, like a crab is exactly what he said. They're moving like a crab. They're looking, they've crept in unawares. And so there's people that creep in unawares to bring in a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. There's certain things you can have disagreements on that are not salvational issues. But there's certain things that are salvational issues like how you get to heaven, how you live, how you're baptized, being baptized in Jesus' name, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Who is Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. Who is the mighty God? How do you live? What you, all these are, are questions of, of truth and power and the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. So there are certain men that are crept in unaware, which were before of old ordained to this condemnation. God knew that they would be there. Ungodly men, and here's what they would do. You'll always know because they're not telling you get on your knees and pray and live for God and separate yourself from the world. But they're turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness lasciviousness that is wickedness and that is excess these type of things they turn the grace of our God not into love the, the grace of God that brings salvation uh, teaches us to live holily and soberly and righteously in this present world Titus 2 verses 11 and 12 and uh, so it doesn't turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness anytime somebody says grace gives you permission to sin Paul's already answered that in the book of Romans. Shall we sin so grace may abound? God forbid. Hallelujah. So they're ordained to this condemnation and turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God. They would say there's not just one God. They would somehow multiply God into you know multi-headed, cerebrus-like being. And, uh, and our Lord Jesus Christ, that God was in flesh. Our Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ was God in flesh. So they'll deny the oneness of God, and they'll deny that oneness of God in Jesus Christ. And so that's what they'll do. And so you have to be very careful when people begin to do that. There's much scripture about that, especially in 1 John and 2 John. And so Jude goes on to say, now just because you were once saved, if you begin to do away with the faith, see, once you got the faith, you got the greatest thing. A lot of people don't realize that. When you're born again of water and spirit, you got the greatest thing in all the world. There's nothing any better than when you're saved. I mean, when you're born again, it is the greatest thing. And uh, I, sometimes, I, I don't even know, we need to start teaching new convert classes, how to start new convert classes. You got the greatest thing in the whole universe. There's nothing better. There's nothing any close. There anywhere close. You got if you're worth a trillion bucks on the plane up to Indianapolis, and man, it was a and, and God's been doing this. I've been 
having flights delayed and everything else, but God's been having divine appointments. So I'm sitting in the little pod, and there's a guy who's a basketball player for the Indianapolis uh, Pacers. His name is Solomon Hill. I think there was a Copeland there and all this. So, you know, see him, and we get on the plane, we're all sitting very close to each other. And so then the, the uh, flight attendant tells me, so, and I saw somebody, I thought, well, that looks like another basketball player named Monta Ellis. And I just called him out of the corner of my eye. So the flight attendant tells me, so that's Monta Ellis over there. And there was a youth group of about 60 there. I think about a dozen chaperones, 48 <laughs> kids, somewhere in there. You know, I'm just guessing numbers. But I know the group was 60 because they said the group was 60 over the intercom. And they were very excited. So it just worked out that I was able to talk to Monta Ellis. And uh, he's, he's the most respectful person in the world you know, in the world system, one of the most I've ever met. Yes, sir, knows, had a wife, two children, two beautiful children, complimented him on his family, told him I taught at a Bible college, and, and just was able to talk with him some. So I, I just a little bit later, I said, well, I'm going to look this guy up. And I said, Monta Ellis, contract. And the guy, he is making $10.3 million this year. He signed last year a four-year, $44 million contract. Now, I'm a little off on that. It's actually four years and, and, and 43985000 But I was just rounding up to $44 million. Well, I'm going to tell you, he's going to make more this year than probably I'm going to make in my whole life. <laughs> probably. $10.3 million. He's going to make more. If you got a contract like Monta Ellis, if you got Jesus, you got stuff he needs. You're more blessed than him. And so you've got to comprehend it like that, that you've got the greatest thing in all the world. I always want to encourage people, you've got the best thing. You know, people, I think people would not backslide if they realized that they got the, the best thing in the whole world. How can you backslide? when you've got the most incredible thing in all the world. So this is what Jude is trying to communicate. He says, verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. He's like, I taught you this, and other people taught you this, how that the Lord having saved, that term saved is not there by accident. Because you go to Exodus, I think it's 1431, the term saved is used as well. Because that Exodus experience Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2, is a type of our salvation. That you have the blood applied at Passover. You have blood here. It's in the form of a cross. And then it drips down to the threshold. So you got, he was bleeding from his head, crown of thorns, on the threshold. And then he was bleeding in his feet. So, and he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Then they had to turn their back on Egypt, which repentance means turn your back. And then they had the cloud that followed them, which means you can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost either before water baptism or after water baptism. Ah. And it says they were all baptized unto Moses, who was the type of Jesus there. Remember, he says, I'll make you a God unto them, little g, God. If you read the Exodus account. And he says that. And so he's a type of Jesus Christ there, and uh, who's the type a of the Lord. capital G God. But he's a, Moses was a type. And he said they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud, spirit baptism, by one spirit, we're all baptized in the one body and in the sea, which is water baptism, in the name of Jesus Christ. And so that term saved right there is not there by accident. Because he's saying just like those people were saved out of the land of Egypt, afterward, if they didn't continue on in the promised land, afterward he destroyed them that believed not. Peter told us, he said, judgment begins at the house of God. So he's saying, just because you're once saved, doesn't mean you're always saved. That's what he's saying. 
So he's saying, just because you got out of Egypt doesn't mean you're in the promised land. He destroyed them. And then he continues on. He gives two more examples. The angels, which kept not their first estate, that followed Lucifer in his rebellion, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting chain under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. So they're confined here to this earth, through the prince and power of the air, but appear to be confined to this atmosphere in chains because they had a rebellion. So they didn't keep their... They were seated in heavenly places with Christ, so to speak, and they did not keep that. And now they're, they're reserved unto darkness. And so then even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So he's saying, look, if, if you don't stay with Jesus, you're not going to be saved. If you don't continue to live in correct doctrine. Verse 7 actually is trying to say bad actions are going to make bad doctrine. If you continue in poor actions, sinful actions, you'll eventually go into false doctrine. So we have to stand strong in the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Psalm 11 and 3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what are the righteous to do? 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 14. Oh, I love reading about David's mighty men. Oh, I love it. Better than Bruce Lee. Better than Jackie Chan. Better than, and I appreciate our Navy SEALs and all of those, better than those guys. I mean, you got, they, you got them out there fighting 800 one time. I mean, just amazing. So you've got somebody, we'll start at verse number 12. And after him was Eleazar, son of Dodo, the Hohite, who was one of the three mighties. And he was with David at Pasdamim. And there the Philistines were gathered together to battle where was a parcel of ground full of barley and the people <laughs> fled from before the Philistines. Now, I believe the Bible wants God's people to be full of courage. He says to endure hardness as good soldiers in Christ. Um, he wants us to have character. So just because everybody else leaves the barley fields of truth that are to feed God's people... God's wanting some people to stand. Just because the uncircumcised Philistines come, don't run. Verse 14, and they set themselves right in the middle of that parcel. They said, we're going to believe this doctrine right in the middle. We're not on the corners of it. And delivered it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. So often all it takes is for somebody or several somebodies to stand for truth. Defend God's food in this end time hour. I'm coming to a close. Defend the doctrine of salvation. Defend who Jesus is. Defend that God has preserved his word. Defend the doctrine of the church. Defend a Christian lifestyle both inside and out. Defend John 3, 7 when it says, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Defend those things. Defend Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, they had healings, they had miracles, they had signs, and people had got baptized. They said it's an incomplete revival till they get the Holy Ghost. Everybody needs the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 10, they just did it the opposite. They got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Peter didn't just say, look at them, they got the Holy Ghost. He said, Let's, I'm going to command you to get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow the book. Follow the word of God. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow your flesh. It's not our doctrine. We didn't create it and we didn't die for it. Jesus did. There was one ark in the Old Testament. Stay in that ark. Build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You've got the greatest thing in all the world. And uh, man, I want to keep that treasure, but I don't want to be like the guy that uh, when Jesus gave out ten talents in that parable and gave to each person a talent, one person gave ten talents, one gave five talents, but one says, well, I got it, and I went and buried it. 
Here it is. I, uh, I want to turn what Jesus has done, and I want to be a blessing to the world. And I know you do as well. Hallelujah. Church, I just want to encourage you about the common faith, the common salvation. Stay strong in it. Let's stand to our feet if you can. Why don't you pray for somebody? Pray for your neighbor. You might want to step out from where you're at. Just ask God to encourage and bless them really good. Let's everybody talk to the Lord together. <laughs> Hallelujah. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to be strong in you and the power of your might. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God, we want to run this race with patience, Lord Jesus Christ. But run it, we will. We want to make it, Lord Jesus. God, we want to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Do miracles in our lives, Lord Jesus Christ. God, let your power, let your truth, God, be in us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Your Holy Ghost is here. Your Spirit is here. Your truth is here, Lord Jesus Christ. We love your word. We love everything about you, Jesus. We love your power, God. We thank you for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, God. We don't want to deviate from it, Lord Jesus Christ. We want to share it, oh God. We want to share your love, share your anointing, share your power with everyone everybody that we meet in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, it's not your will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and everlasting life. Let it happen, Lord Jesus Christ. Let it happen. God, you know where every hurting heart is, Jesus, where every hungry heart is, where every hungry soul is in this area. Open the doors. Let us find them, Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever they are, people we don't know, oh God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, oh God, let us share your great truth. Let us see people born again all over South Georgia, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God, it is your will. God, it is your truth. It is your love. It is your power. It is your plan. God, I glorify you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. God, let everybody, let all of us tonight receive refreshing from on high. In the name of the Lord, your spirit is here. Two or three have gathered in your name, Jesus. You're right here in the middle of us. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I glorify you. I love you. I worship you. the Holy Ghost. Let us walk in your truth, God. Let us walk in your power. In the name of Jesus, never, God, let us deviate one inch from this common faith. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.